but the only thing that people outside the comic book world knew was the Batman thing. And of course they knew it, it, it said Batman is kind of silly and they go, yeah, right. That's what we think too. Um, but that was the perception of Batman um, even years later. And, and they weren't reading the Neil Adams comics. They weren't, you know, reading the Bob Haney things. Um, uh, they just knew Batman. So I, you know, I definitely wanted to make Batman a, a darker and more mature character that would appeal to adults, you know, that would like get to that audience that was too grown up for comics and so forth. Welcome to the Comics Cube, everyone. I am with the legendary Steve Engelhart. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's uh, it surprises me that it's still daytime over there. Actually, uh, yeah, it's only the middle of the afternoon. That's actually. true. Because uh, I'm talking to someone from the states. Usually, when it's daytime here, it's <laughs> nighttime there. Um, yeah. my first question is uh, when you were you know, why do you love comics? It's the first question I ask everyone. Why comics? I just really like the rhythms and the art. The, you know, the punchiness of it. I've done other, I can answer that question better than I used to be able to because I've done other things. Tried writing, you know, video games and TV scripts and books and this kind of stuff. And I've always said writing is writing, which it is. Mm -hmm. But I really, you know, it's the rhythms of comics, the um, just the, the structure that is necessary to do comics that interests me. Would you still put it as your favorite medium to work in? Yeah, at? I would actually. Yeah. And your favorite medium to consume? Uh, not anymore. Uh, once upon a time, I read everything before I got into comics. And then as long as I was in comics, I read everything by everybody. But I've been out of comics now for like 15 years. So I'm not really following the books. I am following the movies, which is more of what comics is now to the world i guess yeah how uh, what what does it make you feel like looking at the marvel movies specifically and seeing so many of the things that you created and just on screen for everyone to consume um that also evolves over time i mean the basic answer is i'm i'm happy with it i mean i i like the idea that they you know if they're gonna make the movies about characters that i did that they honor you know, uh, what it is that I did. Um, they sometimes play around with it, but I get that because, you know, they're doing a, an entire story in two hours, whereas I was doing it in monthly segments or whatever, um, different rhythms again, and different, and different, um, just, you gotta do a beginning and a middle and an end in three hours, two hours or three hours if it's the Avengers. Um, <laughs> uh as opposed to comics um but when i went to the shang chi debut in los angeles um it came out of it and i you know and i was happy you know it, it's they took a lot of my stuff and used it and other stuff that changed and you know but I, that was good but it, but somebody came up to me where well, i'm we were standing on hollywood boulevard which they closed down this entire block, which is amazing to me because it's a block that gets used. It's in the city. But every time they do a premiere, they close down the block and they put out a red carpet and they put up uh, struck scaffolding to keep the, the fans at bay and all this kind of stuff. So I came out of the theater. And I'm standing there looking at down Hollywood Boulevard with all these people all dressed up to have come to the to the premiere and the fans you know, waiting over there and all that stuff. And somebody said to me, do you realize that all of this is because of you? And I had not thought about that in those, you know, the, in any terms, really. And I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going over to like, yeah, it's all me. But it's just, it is interesting, yeah. you know, that I, Jim Starlin and I came up with this idea and we did this idea and, and now millions of people, if you read the credits, Millions of people are getting their livelihood from developing this thing into something that they can do. And again, they're doing it, but it just, it is. 
you're literally responsible for thousands of jobs. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, in one on one sense, I am. And and so, but all of this is sort of surreal. I mean, really, I mean, we did comics um, to do comics. I mean, we just loved comics, all of us in that in that early 70s thing when we all came in about the same time. We loved doing comics and you did a comic and it went out and people enjoyed it and then you did the next one and so on. I mean, but nobody thought that we'd be living in this situation with the movies and the Hollywood Boulevard and that, you know, and all that stuff. So um, I find it surreal, yeah. uh, for want of a better word, you know? Yeah, I was taking a very quick look at it the other day, like all of the Marvel movies that have come out mm -hmm. since yeah. Iron Man. And I'm like, if I attribute it to the creators, I feel like you come in around maybe fourth or fifth, you know, they're obviously they're Stan and Jack and Steve. Right. And then just because, just because the big climax was infinity war and Endgame, Jim Starlin and George yeah. Perez. And then when I look at the rest of it, I'm like, I think this is Steve Englehart because I'm looking at Dr. Strange and, and the guardians of the galaxy and, you know, Mantis and uh, Shang-Chi and, Wanda like, Vision. Wanda Vision. Yeah. yeah. There's I just mean, so yeah. many. I'm like, and, and Kang now. Yeah. 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 Well, I didn't invent Kang, but I, you know, but I sort of revved him up, I guess. But um, yeah. I mean, you leveled I wrote up. so many yeah. different things. I wrote so many different things that, yeah, I'm, I see my name in the credits quite a bit. A yeah. lot. Yeah. You were, when you were coming up, when did you, what was the comic? that made you fall in love with comics? Uh, well, okay, two different answers. When I was a kid, um, I was a kid in the 50s. And so the only superheroes that existed were like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and maybe Martian Manhunter or something. But I mean, there, there, wasn't, there weren't superheroes. And so um, what I really liked was the Dick Tracy Reprints, um, Chester Gould, yeah, doing Dick Tracy with the really dark, you know, thick, nice line and stuff, which I'm an, I'm a sucker for comic book art, which is where we started this, um, and but then I, uh, you know, uh, that was my favorite as a kid, but I outgrew all comics the way kids do, and then when I was a freshman in college, a guy shoved a Spider Man in my hand, the Ditko Spider Man. And said you have to read this and i did and i liked it and i you know and that was kind of the beginning of, of uh, everything that's happened ever since in, in marvel comics so it's interesting you missed the start of the marvel age i did yeah i was i was out of comics not interested in comics at the time um this was the spider-man thing was in the spring of 66 and it was like spider-man number 31 30 something right in there the master Where planner we saga huh the master planner saga um i guess i it, i think it was a one shot so it was it wasn't the okay. saga but i mean 33 maybe i don't know somewhere in there but um that was in the spring of the year and then college uh let out for the summer and i went back to my hometown and spent the summer going to antique stores, going through boxes of used comic books, where I was able to sort of fill in the missing five years um, for a nickel a comic kind of thing, you know? Um, so by the end of the summer, I'd pretty much caught up with, uh, you know, with the entire Marvel universe. Um, and then I was contemporary after that. I feel like with Dick Tracy and then getting into uh, Steve Ditko, Spider-Man, uh, is it safe to say that you were a fan of the more offbeat type of protagonist? Yeah, yeah. But I've always been a big Batman fan. And he's, you know, I guess he's not offbeat, but he is kind of. Um, but yeah, I, I, when I said I read everything, I mean, I read all the romance books. I read the Western books. I, you know, I mean, it was just like comics as a thing was just fascinating to me. Um, so, you know, 
whether I leaned in one direction or not, I still read all the DC comics and all the Marvel comics and all the Charlton <clears throat> comics and so forth. So some I like better than others, but there were a whole bunch that I did like. So it's sort of hard to say if I was particularly pulled in one direction or another. Um, art was always, because again, stories were in the 50s, stories were reasonably non-existent. And, and I, that one of the reasons I really liked this whole story universe thing of Marvel. Um, but always it was it was art that would catch my eye and and um you know ditko's art uh was fun to look at uh yeah. chester gould's art was fun to look at dick sprang's art for batman was fun to look at uh so that was i guess that's what was leading me more than anything just art that i like the art and then later the stories why do you think uh would you say dick tracy is a product of his time like, what do you think he doesn't you know? Nothing's been really done with him in a long time. I know he has his well, daily my, strip. Yeah. My friend Joe Staten is doing the art on yeah. it now. Joe and I did Green Lantern together and worked on other things. Um, so, I, you know, when Chester Gould died, um, I forget his name now, Dick something, I think the guy who worked at the Chicago Tribune took it over. And then when he died, um, Joe came on for the art and, and another guy came on for the writing. Um, I just think it, it was, I mean, the early stuff is really pulp gangster, you know, detective stuff. And then he went off into shaky and headache and, and uh, I'm immediately blanking out on all the guys dot com and and yeah i mean but it was like he did the batman villains in this dark style in the 30s and 40s um uh i'm sure that's where a lot of bob kane and and jerry robinson's and, and bill fingers inspiration came from was dick tracy um and also the pulps the spider uh those things um but it did come very much out of that whole 30s gangster thing. And then the 40s, he started to let it run, 40s, 50s. But by the 60s, he was doing the Moon Maid. Um, I don't know if any of this means anything in the Philippines, but I mean, he was doing outer space stuff and, and aliens and stuff in Dick Tracy, which yeah. I think he wanted to do it, obviously, but I don't think I think that's where a lot of people, you know, bailed out. Um, and then by the time he was gone and other people took over, newspaper strips had really fallen off in American newspapers, right? I mean, they, they just, it's all, it's all gag a day stuff now. There's, there's almost no, almost nobody carries uh, a daily strip where an adventure happens day after day. Uh, I was sort of surprised that there are people that do, you know, I mean, there are newspapers sort of in the middle of the country or, you know, where things are slower, I guess, uh, where they where they do that. But I mean, uh, all, you know, when I was a kid, again, lots and lots of strips like that, you know, lots and lots of, of soap operas and detective stories and things that were played out in newspapers. But newspapers have gotten smaller, things cost more, whatever. I mean, it's just not, I don't, I think even if, um, you know, I mean, even if somehow two, two best artists ever got on Dick Tracy now, I don't know that you could do much with it. Well, my friend, um, uh, I'm blanking that too, forget that. Anyway, um, it's just newspaper strips, sadly. Yeah. That was, that was a thing and now it's not. Is there a specific writer that, you know, sparked your interest in your doing your own writing for comics? Well, both Stan and Roy, I think, um, and there were other people that that I liked, Archie Goodwin, right? Um, again, there wasn't any one particular person. I, I had got to credit Stan, though, for sort of creating that whole universe and juggling all those characters and, and so forth. Um, I really liked the whole universe situation, yeah. but I wasn't looking to be a writer. I was, I was looking to be an artist. Um, 
and you know was sort of breaking into the business as as a as an artist uh, but i got offered a chance to write one day and i said sure why not and i did and i liked it i liked the writing and then they liked what i wrote and so then they started offering me more and then pretty soon i was all my time was filled up with writing um but it really was art once again that kind of got me to that point and but obviously i read stories and knew which ones i liked it there is an alternate universe somewhere where you became where you became a full-time artist instead of a full-time writer what do you think that would have been like like who would you have worked on would, uh, like... well it's hard i mean obviously my interests are all over the place right i mean i probably would have enjoyed working on anything i mean i did it from a writing standpoint i liked you know i like getting inside characters heads now we're talking as a writer but it applies i guess but i i like being Captain America or being Batman or being Hal Jordan or, you know, being the Silver Surfer or being the Joker. I mean, it's like trying to just, you know, get inside those heads, um, which works out great for writing. Uh, I could, I could probably, you know, if I were doing art, I would probably be doing art that really reflected what I was getting out of these people's consciousness their gestures and so forth based on that but i it, you wouldn't it, it's not as clear as if it was as if i'm writing actual thoughts and, and dialogue and so forth you started writing comics in 1971 um with yeah. vampirella uh what was that like working for for warren um it was i liked it um when i started working at marvel um I got a weekly salary and, but it was minuscule really. And the idea was for everybody in comics was you would do freelance in your, in your free time. Um, somebody at the front door. Um, <laughs> do you but, need to get that? Uh, uh, she did, my sister, my sister, my wife will get it. Um, so Marvel didn't like fill up my dance card right away. It's like, you know, here, write a romance, write a Western, you know, while we're still figuring out whether you actually can do this. So it was perfectly cool for me to go out and get work at another company. But I did use a pseudonym because um, I was on staff at Marvel, right? Yeah. So I couldn't very well put my, my actual name uh, on the Vampirella stuff. That being said, it was, it, there were a lot of small companies in those days. And Warren, you know, he had an office in a building in New York and 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 so forth. He was I I liked him, Jim, and and um, I I liked Vampirella, um, and and so it was kind of fun to have a second office to go into, you know, a second group of people to deal with. Um, not that I had any problem dealing with the Marvel people, but it was just it as I was getting into the business and also getting into living in New York, which you had to do in those days. Um, because there was no FedEx or internet or whatever, you had to physically hand things to people. So you had to go to New York and I was not from New York. So I was learning the ways of the big city. <laughs> um, I, I, it wasn't like I just stepped off a boat, I, you know, but I mean, if you live in New York, you have to, there's, there are, there's, you know, things you have to know, things you have to do, places you don't go at certain times of the day, that kind of stuff, which I, you know. That's overwhelming, heard. isn't it? Uh, at first. Well, I mean, it wasn't I, not, no, I don't know, overwhelming, but just like I was learning new stuff all the time. Yeah. Right. I mean, just like because people who live there, you know, they'll go, oh, yeah, well, we're going over to, you know, 7th Avenue and 25th Street, that place over there. And you're like, I don't know that place over there, but I'll go, you know, I'll find it. Um, it's a lot of real estate to have to kind of build into your brain. Um, and then, as I say, parts of it you don't want to go there and parts of it you know i mean it just it's a lot of stuff but i was doing that learning comics it was all fun it was you know you're young and in a new place and getting to be creative um so it was it was good you did so much for marvel in those five years 1971 to 1976 i'm not sure there are many people who have done as much work in in a five-year span uh, what was your favorite thing to work on in that five years, man? 
Well, again, I'm, I, I can't say any one thing because I did like to get inside everybody's head. And so, you know, I can't say, oh, Captain America was more fun than Doctor Strange, was more fun than the Batman, which I also did in that period. I mean, every one of them, I tried to do the best I could with it. Um, and so that meant enjoying what, you know, what they were. Um, I just, I was enjoying the fact that I was being able to write all those things. I mean, once, once Marvel did decide to start giving me stuff and I had to give up Vampirella, uh, I, you know, I was writing what Avengers, Captain America, the Hulk, Dr. Strange, Luke Cage. I mean, all these things at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and that was great. I mean, that was fun. Uh with with uh with in in that span of time you know you brought back patsy walker yeah you were writing the defenders uh you yeah. you brought in the valkyrie uh brunhilde yeah. uh you also introduced mantis and i was there a conscious decision on your part to introduce a good number of female characters uh not per se but when i took over the avengers I was told by somebody in, in Marvel editorial that the deal with the Scarlet Witch was she would do a hex and then she would fall down exhausted. And I was like, wait, she's an Avenger. How is that, you know? So I didn't, I, I remember that distinctly. It's not that I had to do stronger women from some personal point of view but I just sort of felt like I should in terms of storytelling. I mean, it made, you know, how, how much can you do with a person who falls down a lot, you know? Um, so Scarlet Witch got tougher. Um, with the Defenders, I needed somebody who was um, belligerent because they all were, but not connected to any one of them per se, you know? And so Valkyrie just fit that bill. I, I don't know that I did it because she was female or because of any of that. Um, and Mantis, Mantis was going to be um, sort of femme fatale. She was gonna come into the Avengers and sort of seduce all the male members and get them to turn on each other and, and so forth. That was my idea, but I introduced her. And then right after that was when Marvel said, this year, we're not going to do any annuals. We've been doing annuals every summer for five, six years, but we're not going to do any annuals. And I really liked the annuals. As a reader, I, that was always a cool thing in the summer to get the big book with all the extra stuff. Um, so I said, well, I'll do this Avengers Defenders thing, right? Um, and it'll run all summer and it'll be like an event. And you know, I wanted to give that to the fans, whatever. Um, and the upshot, which I didn't realize for years, didn't think about it for years. Mantis had to become a teammate at that point. But I was, cause I was staging these little battles and she had to, you know, if she was just, she couldn't vamp anybody. She couldn't be sexy. She just, it was a battle, it was a war. So she had to do something. And once she became a teammate, then she started off down her own path. And this, this, is, this is the great epiphany of my writing career is that you can sit there and go, well, I'm going to do this with this character because I created it. But then you, the character starts to go off in her own direction, right? I mean, if somebody does something, then now that's going to affect how they do the next thing. Yeah. You know, as soon as you start doing things, you're laying down a track and, and you have to stay on that track. You can't just sort of jump over here somewhere. Um, so she, I think she would have been probably just as strong, just as, um, you know, have the same powers, et cetera, et cetera, if she'd been the femme fatale, but, but by turning her into a teammate, then she just, the story just kind of kept unfolding. As, you know, I never, never got to the point, I mean, for a long time, I didn't, eventually I did, but I, it took me a long time to get to the point of saying, yeah, I, I have no more to say about this person because she just kept opening up to my way of thinking. You know? It's uh, 
I feel like that's true of any creative endeavor, right? It's like, if this is true, then what else is true? And then yeah. it, it just keeps on going from there. You obviously have a, you obviously have a very big attachment to Mantis because you took her everywhere with you, no matter what yeah. company you were working for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, again, uh, so yeah, I, I finished off the Mantis saga at Marvel and, and, and so forth. But when I left Marvel and went over to DC to do the Justice League and Batman, um, I went to the San Diego Comic Book Convention and somebody came up to me and said, does this mean no more Mantis? <laughs> and I took that as a challenge. It's like, I'll figure out a way to do more Mantis, even though I'm not at Marvel anymore. So that's why I introduced her in the Justice League under her second name. Um, and then I thought, I'll put her in everything forever. But then that, that's not practical either, right? Uh, so I did bring her into the Scorpio Rose um, thing that I did for Eclipse in the 80s. But, um, and actually I wrote some novels about 10 years ago now. Um, and she's in those, because um, I do own her. But I mean, uh, yeah, again, she just sort of, everything was sort of like, led one thing led to another with her but i do like her yes i do yeah she's she's such a strange character in the sense that it's not anyone else writing mantis doesn't feel right you know what i mean yeah like I'm, I'm <laughs> nice to, nice of you to say yeah uh that she's one of those characters who's like that and there's not a lot of characters that's like that that i i feel like it's completely owned by just one writer yeah but of course we don't own them that's you know there's that aspect of the whole business thing yeah. um but yeah in like 2002 Brevoort asked me to come in and he said you know everybody's been screwing her up but i'd like you to come in and do that avengers celestial quest thing that could kind of put her back on track but as soon as i did that she went off track again you know i mean so um I, you know, I obviously understand her completely, but uh, um, it's a, it's a, it's not like Doctor Strange cosmic or anything, but there's, you know, there's aspects of having a sort of expanded consciousness if you're going to marry a tree and, 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 you know, and live in a plant society and so on and so forth, which, you know, not everybody's consciousness expands uh, uh, equally. Uh, I, I've, uh, I've read that you weren't a big fan of uh, Greer Nelson as the cat. Uh, you and mean the comic book? The yeah, the, the comic book, the cat. Um, well, I don't, I don't. Because my next that... question is, uh, so, so what was the impetus to put Patsy Walker in that same suit? Well, no, it was, it was, um. I didn't care about the cat one way or the other, particularly. That was the thing Marvel decided they were going to do comics for girls, and they got female people to do them. And, you know, I mean, it had nothing to do really with the, the sex of the person, but uh, none of those books was like a world beater, really. Um, they all ended fairly quickly. Um, and so I didn't really pay much attention to them, but. Um, when I was doing the beast, I had, I was, had access to the rest of the X-Men, but when you're doing, when you write a series, you have access to all of the, the stuff. Like if you're the fantastic four writer, then you're also in charge of Dr. Doom and, you know, Annihilus and, and the silver surfer, unless he gets his own book. I mean, that kind of thing. And, and since the X-Men, the X-Men book had died. Um, most of the X-Men were not, the, none of the other X-Men were regulars in the Beast book, although they could guest star. I didn't have a lot of people to play with. Once again, you know, it's like I needed, I needed more people to be able to tell stories. And I remembered that Patsy Walker had come, was a cool bit in Fantastic Four Annual number four, when Reed and Sue got married and they walked out of the church, the entire Marvel universe is standing out there applauding them. And in, right in the front of the row are Patsy and Hetty, Patsy Walker and Hetty uh, Wolf, uh, who had that romance books for years and years and years and years. 
so they'd come into the Marvel Universe. It wasn't like, you know, and I thought, I mean, I, in that case, I did think, yes, I need, I need a woman. I need, you know, I need somebody here to, you know, to give me a different perspective. And I remembered her from that. And so I brought her in for that reason that I, you know, I just, I could get her. Nobody else was using Patsy Walker. And, and in terms of the beast, she comes in and she says, well, I'll protect your secret identity if you'll do me a favor. And then the series got canceled before I ever had to figure out what the favor was. Um, so then later when I was doing the Avengers and reconstituting the group and, and so forth, I thought, okay, the beast has joined now. So then it would be logical for her to show up and now she could figure out what she was gonna do. And I always liked the idea of, um, I did a Patsy Walker three part thing with Norm Brayfogle again in that early 2000s. Yeah. And her touchstone is she keeps saying, I'm just a girl. I mean, while she's going in that series, she's going to hell, she's having battles with demons, all this stuff. But in her mind, she's just a girl who, you know, got this thing. And that's what I always liked about Patsy was that uh, she could join, she could play with the big boys. She could get in there and, and hold up her end of it because uh, she was, you know, she was tough. Her history, her, her Marvel history was that she was, you know, a reasonably strong woman, whatever. Um, but she never saw herself as I'm a superhero and I'm, you know, going to do this. I'm going to, she's just Patsy Walker, which, which I, I liked that headspace. It's a long answer to your question, but there you go. Uh, what would you give, you know, what advice would you give to anybody who's writing Kang? Because I feel like reading any Kang story with Immortus and the Scarlet Centurion is does it get confusing? Uh, well, when I did the first time with him in Giant Size Avengers number two and, and the crossover with Avengers 129, as I recall, um, somebody said to me, nobody can ever do good time travel stories because they can never figure out all of the all of the conundrums. And of course, I took that as a challenge and said, well, I'm going to I'm going to do that. And so that's what I tried to do in that thing, work out how the, he went forward. But he came around and he came in backwards and he did all this stuff. Um, so then, you know, when I brought him back the second time uh, or brought him back for the first time, I guess, but his second appearance, um, I wanted to try another time travel thing. And then I thought, which I still think is the coolest thing about him, is that like you can spend a month beating him and he'll go away for 10 years and he'll come back 10 minutes after he left. And he's had all his time to refresh and, and plan and all that. And you've had 10 minutes. I thought that was extremely cool. So I kept bringing him back again and again. And people began to complain that he was, he was there all the time. Um, but uh, there's if you if you can think your way through time travel stories time travel stories are pretty cool was that an actual complaint that that you were using kang, kang too much oh yeah people said you know we want to see other super villains i mean which i get you know but uh and this hadn't been done i mean a guy who could get beaten and then come right back again and then get beaten and then come right back again um that hadn't been done so it was unusual for some people it didn't fit the usual parameters of comics i i get all that you know but i was pursuing that concept for the 141st issue of avengers you got you know an up-and-coming artist named george perez right and you had the squadron sinister squadron supreme in it uh he would one of the last works he would do of course is justice league avengers mm -hmm. uh, how how do you feel about that knowing that you you know you you basically started the circle that he went full circle on well i mean i i was there when he started his circle i put it that way yeah. um uh but one of the cool things i've said this before was um i was you know i mean above me in the marvel hierarchy was roy thomas who was the editor in charge and above him had been stan and Stan, you know, when Stan hired Roy and Denny O'Neill, 
stand, you know, made sure to keep the best artists for himself. And, you know, and the, and the other guys got sort of the whoever was left. And Roy continued that tradition in some respects. I mean, there were times when, uh, you know, I wasn't going to get John Buscema, for example. I wasn't going to get this net. So I ended up with like new guys like uh, Paul DeLacy and like George Perez, you know, um, and and so that was sort of how George ended up doing the book with me and that, you know, and the cool thing, I, I said this in the introduction to the various masterworks that, that cover this era, but you can see George getting better every month. I mean, every month he's like thinking, what can I do here that, you know, and you can just see it as it goes, um, which was which was very cool. Um, but I mean, was I happy working with George? Of course, I was happy working with George. You know, could throw uh, anything at him. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and I mean, he had to do the thing with the Cowboys, with Kang in the Old West, but in the you know, and this and that. Um, I I do I do Sal Buscema, whom I did a lot of my early stuff with, is my touchstone on this. But an artist who can draw anything is a very valuable artist because there are people who can't draw hands or they can't draw horses or they can't so they, so you end up having to like not do horses <laughs> you know and not do things but it's much obviously much cooler if you can think of something and not have to worry about can they actually do this or not uh you also did dr strange with gene colin so that's another yeah. legendary artist that mm. you worked with what's what was it like working with gene it was fun working with Gene. I, I had done um, Doctor Strange with Frank Brunner to that point, and that was a, you know, that people paid attention to that. Um, so over the years, I, I think, well, at the time, to switch from Frank Brunner to anybody, there were people who, who didn't, who weren't happy with that, which really, we're talk, yes, we're talking about Gene Colin here, but I mean, Brunner had such a distinct style that, that, you know, for a long time, people would sort of say, oh, yeah, you and Brunner, you and Brunner, you and Brunner. And I go, yeah, but I also did a year with Gene, you know. Um, uh, and before he died, Gene was sort of going around doing appearances or whatever. And, and the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco did an evening with him. And I came over and, you know, I was all prepared to talk about the many stories that we'd done. And then I looked and I said, well, we only did 12. I mean, I, I somehow I thought, because Colin was so much a part of everything, you know, Colin, wherever you went in comics, you'd find Colin doing something cool. So it, so it seemed to me that I must have worked with him more than just that one year on Doctor Strange, but I didn't. But the difference, I mean, what I could say about Gene with Frank, Frank and I would like work out the stories together. You know, we'd sit there and he'd say, I want to, I want to do this. And I'd go, I want to do this. And I, it was up to me as the writer then to kind of put that into a coherent thing. Gene didn't care. Gene was just like, tell me what the story is and I'll draw it. You know, he didn't, I offered him the opportunity to, you know, to get involved. Um, I, di I didn't usually work with my artists that way. And it didn't surprise me when he said no, but I mean, I had done it with Frank. So I figured I should offer Gene the option. Um, but he was, you know, he was comfortable just, you know, tell me what the story is. And, and that's interesting too. When you look, you know, I mean, he, he had drawn cosmic stuff for Roy and, you know, I mean, he could do it, but he could do it just fine. But the fact that we never really talked about it, I would just say, well, it's this, it's this panel and there's a guy and he's huge and we can do this and that, you know, he just draw that. It was not, you know, photographic, realistic gene. Um, so I yeah it was it was fun doing that second second half of of my Doctor Strange run uh, with him and I and I obviously wish I had done a lot more with him. You guys ended the whole universe and restarted the whole universe, which yes, that strikes me as amazing because that would never happen today. That would be a full event. In, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean. I was writing Doctor Strange and people were threatening to destroy the earth. And I thought, well, of course, nobody ever destroys the earth. And then, of course, I thought, well, what if we did, you know? And to my mind, again, you know, to my mind, the idea was, okay, everything ended. But then it all started again and nobody knew 
except for Doctor Strange, which I thought was kind of cool that Strange would have to carry that knowledge, but nobody else would have it. However, fairly quickly, um, I think it was Len Wein at that point who was writing Spider-Man said, are you telling me that my Spider-Man died and this is a different Spider-Man? And I'm going, no, no, it's the same guy. It's just, you know, there was this, what do we call it now? A blip? What, what are the, the movies? What do we <laughs> call blip. it? Yeah. Um, uh, so I did see how, you know, killing all the Marvel characters might be something. I mean, even if they don't know, I can understand why that was a little um over the top but but i just i really like the idea that, yeah they did destroy the earth now what you know it's dr strange can he fix this you know um that was the that was the emphasis impetus of that how'd you get away with that well we had complete creative freedom i mean they they said roy said when he gave me captain america he said if you can turn this in on time every month and you can make it sell, then you can keep doing it. And if you can't do one or the other or both, we will fire you and we'll get somebody who can do that. Um, and otherwise, do whatever you want because I don't have time to micromanage all these books, said Roy. Um, so that was the thing. If, if, if I was meeting my deadlines and the books were selling, then Marvel really didn't care what, I mean, they cared if you were going to like get them sued or, or do something like that. But I mean, you want to kill all the characters for a blip? You know, do you want to have the head of the secret empire end up in the White House? I yeah. mean, do you want to, you know, all that stuff. It was like, is the book selling? Yes, it is. Well, then he must be doing something that people like. So let him do it, you know, which is a very, not a common attitude, shall we say. You know, I mean, again, not only you know, comics, many people really like 70s comics. And I can say that was to a great extent because that's, you let people just go, just do what they wanted to do. Um, as time has gone on, and as, you know, there's more and more bureaucracy and there's, you know, and then there's now Disney owns Marvel and then, you know, blah, 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 blah. So now, I mean, I mean, you know, specifically he handed me Captain America and he said, do what you want to do with Captain America, right? If you were handed Captain America today, they would be telling you what you're going to do and what, you know, how it's not going to like impact this thing over here and you have to worry about this. And I mean, it's just a much bigger structure. Once again, I get, I get that, but we just happened to be there at a time when things were young and loose and, and uh, everybody took advantage of it to whatever extent they could. So It's a much smaller company back then uh what would you how would you look back at that secret empire story now well i'm real happy with it i mean i i was writing captain america and it's supposed to be marvel universe is supposed to be the real universe and i'm and everybody in america was riveted to the watergate hearings i mean um the president was accused of being the crook and they were having these hearings they were on all three television networks live every day there weren't a thousand cable channels and, and so on and so forth. So it was one of those things where all of America just was into the whole Watergate thing. And I thought, how can Captain America just kind of skate past that? That doesn't make any sense to me. So I have to do something. It's that same thing. I need to come up with a story that fits this reality. And, and um, you know, I mean, it, it, it came out really nicely, but then much like Mantis, it's like, well, okay, what happens next? Well, then he becomes the nomad and then, you know, what happens next and and very much the same concept of just one thing leads to another until you somehow get to the end of it you know is it safe to say uh you know i'm, I'm speaking as a fan here and i'm just working off assumptions is it safe to say that your favorite collaborator was marshall rogers no i mean no. he was he was a favorite yeah you know but i mean I like working with Gene. I like working with Frank. I like working with Jim Starlin. I mean, it's like, there's really, I mean. Because you guys went everywhere guys, together. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, some I work with Sal Buscema a whole lot. And I really like Sal Buscema. And we went, we did all sorts of things. Um, again, it just, I like comics. And so, 
Um, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't have had a better collaborator on Batman than Marshall. I mean, Marshall was the perfect guy and Terry Austin doing the inks. Both of those guys were perfect for that. Um, but did I like Marshall more than I liked Al Milgram? I mean, it's like, I can't, uh, I can't uh, make those distinctions. Yeah. Um, did you like the Adam West Batman TV show? At the time, yeah. I mean, I was, I was, because that's like right when I got back into comics again. So comics was, was cool. And, and even though this was a, you know, a camp series, it still was Batman and Robin on TV twice a week, maybe even three times a week for a while. Um, uh, so it was comics. It was another example of comics. Um, and so I didn't worry about whether it was a pastiche or, you know, what it was. Um, the joke wore thin after a while. The series got, got boring after a while because, you know, it was sort of a one joke concept. But uh, no, I mean, Batman on TV caused Batman the comics sales to like explode. Um, and, and so that's all good. I mean, I'm, I wasn't even working in comics at that point, but I'm like, yeah, more people are reading it. That's a good thing. Because again, yeah, sorry, but in those days in America, there was this bubble and people inside the bubble knew and liked comics. And then everybody outside that bubble just knew that comics were trash. Just, you know, and you couldn't bridge it. You couldn't say, look, look at this Jack Kirby art here. We read, the, read this story and go, no, I just know comics are no good. They're just for juvenile delinquents and sailors and stuff, you know I mean? And now, of course, it's, it's completely the other way around. Everybody knows all the characters and so on. Um, so, well, it's just, yeah, forget where we started all of this, well, actually. Well, when you got on Batman, yeah. did you feel the need to maybe counteract the perception that was caused by the TV show? Well, DC mentioned that um, when I when I came in. I mean, what you saw was very much what I thought Batman ought to be. But DC did say, you know, despite Neil Adams, despite the rest of it, well, that's what I was going to say, that comics, but the only thing that people outside the comic book world knew was the Batman thing. And of course, they knew it. It, it said Batman is kind of silly. And they go, yeah, right. That's what we think, too. Um, but that was the perception of Batman, um, even years later, and, and they weren't reading the Neil Adams comics, they weren't, you know, reading the Bob Haney things. Um, uh, they just knew Batman. So I, you know, I definitely wanted to make Batman a, a darker and more mature character that would appeal to adults, you know, that would like, get to that audience that was too grown up for comics and so forth. Um, so that's why, you know, I gave him a sex life, in, you know, in the form of Silver St. Cloud. Um, that's why I made the Joker back into a homicidal maniac. I mean, all this stuff, I wanted the darkness, but I wanted the, wanted to know about Bruce Wayne. I wanted to know about this guy who's living in that world. Um, and, and in order, you know, so I did what I did, but, it, but it did have the effect of being sort of an antidote to the, the Adam West concept of the Batman. Yeah. Uh, before we get to your run with Marshall, uh, Night of the Stalker is one of the yeah. standalone issues that gets mentioned a lot, especially among creators, as being a favorite. Well, that was all uh, Sal Amendola. Sal was my roommate at the time. And he, you know, he and his brother, I guess, and, and I've been a while, but I mean, he came to me and he had it all drawn and he said, you know, you're a writer. I, I need you to write this thing for me. So I just, you know, I took this fully formed story and I dialogued it. Um, Interesting. So I, you know, I, I hope I did a good job, you know, doing that end of it. But um, I think Sal Amendola um, and Neil Adams had a hand in it too somehow. I don't quite remember all the details, but I mean, those guys were the ones who, who really 
sort of put that thing together. Didn't Neil have a hand in just about everything that was going on back then? Like uh, he would have liked to. <laughs> um, he was, you know, Neil was very much a mover and shaker amongst the comic book community. So, I mean, he wanted to start the Comic Book Creators Guild, um, you know, and, and he was an advocate for Siegel and Schuster um, yeah. and so on and so forth. So he was in a lot of places, but I, I, I don't know that I'd say he was in everything. Um, yeah. He just, he, but he was, you know, he was in more than the average yeah. person, certainly. Um, so getting back, getting to your run with Marshall, that is, I'm going to say something that I feel like you guys have heard a lot. That is my favorite Batman run of all time. Thank you. And is that, is that something that you get told a lot? Yes. Um, yeah. It's, um, I mean, to this day, when DC does a greatest whatever thing over there, at least one of those stories is going to be in there somewhere. Um, we, I mean, I just, I'd loved Batman ever since I was a kid, right? He was, of the kid, of the heroes in the 50s, he was cooler than Superman or Wonder Woman, you know? I mean, I'd, I'd liked him for a very long time. And so I really wanted to do like the best Batman that I could. Um, but, the, but the luck of it all is, is that they assigned Marshall and Terry to do the art and they had the same philosophy. They wanted to do the best Batman they could. So, you know, most of the good artists, Neil, Gil Kane, you know, had gone from DC over to Marvel at that point. Marvel was the one that was really out in front and that's where you wanted to be. And so DC didn't have a very deep stable of artists and it was entirely possible that it could have been given to a couple of journeyman guys who would have just hacked it out. And that, see, I, that's something that as a writer, I always find fascinating. I mean, you, you can't, can't prove it, but I mean, if those exact same scripts had been illustrated by hacks, people would not think of that overall run as being as good as it was. And they would think that my writing was worse too, because people can't differentiate. Um, yeah. They can't pull that out. Um, but no, everything fell into place uh, for that. Um, our problem, of course, was that DC doesn't like creators to be known for doing, you know, they don't want to hear that Batman is by Englehart and Rogers. They just want to hear Batman is by DC. Uh, so that comic book run led to the movie, led to our not getting any more Batman work for the next 20 years, you know. Um, it, was, it was 30 years later before they asked Marshall and me to do Batman again. That's terrible. Uh, it is terrible. I totally agree. Um, but they, you know, they, when people started saying Englehart and Rogers, then DC started trying to, you know, sweep that under the rug. I mean, Frank Miller will tell you the same thing about, you know, and, and Alan Moore will tell you the same thing. It's just DC doesn't like, as far as they're concerned, it's DC's Batman and, and, um, they, they also think it's DC's Watchmen. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you know, um, I, I will say that I could not see any value in when they did more Watchmen comics. I did like the the HBO Watchmen. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. so much better than the movie. Yeah, well, I mean, it's got like this really cool story and they really worked it all through. And I, and although I'm disappointed, I totally understand when the guy who did it says, oh, that was it, I'm not gonna make this a series. I'm gonna, you know, I just, I just did this one-off thing. Um, so anyway, yeah, yeah the DC. I'm sorry about not, that. Not my favorite. Um, I, I anyway. get it, I get it. But I hope you don't mind if I ask you a couple more questions about it, because no, go ahead. Uh, Silver Saint Cloud is like Mantis, another character that I feel doesn't feel right if it's not written by you. Like, I feel like I say that about you a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, I just have I mean, all writers have every writer has a particular 
voice and a particular style and so on and so forth. Somehow or other, the stuff that I really like to do in comics seems to be popular with a lot of people about when it gets done in comics. Um, and I, you know, but I mean, I see silver just as clearly as I see any of the rest of them. And so when I, when they asked us after 30 years to come back and do more stuff, both Marshall and I sort of remarked on the fact that it had been 30 years, but on the other hand, it was like yesterday. I mean, you know, we knew exactly who these characters were and, and what we were going to do with them. Um, but she was designed to be a strong woman in her own right, because if you're going to hang out with Bruce Wayne, yeah, right, you got to be able to, to hold up through all that. And she was no nonsense and she was smart and all, you know, all these things that I thought would make a good girlfriend for Bruce Wayne, right? She I mean, figures out who he is. Yeah, you know, yeah. And no, that was, that's like ending the world or anything else. It's just like, well, we never do that. Well, why don't we do that then? You know, let's yeah. see how that works, where, where that goes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, I've had, a, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of things that did work out. Um, I wish they all could have worked out. And I particularly wish Batman had worked out uh, the way some of the, I mean, the rest of this has basically, but DC, the more, the more popularity we got, the less they wanted us to do it. That's so strange. That's so yeah. strange. Yeah. Um, why did you guys bring back Deadshot? after so many years in a completely different costume instead of just creating somebody new um that was an extra issue they had when i started doing it i i was planning on leaving the country i was planning on going to europe for the first time and traveling around after i left marvel and then dc called up and said would you come over and and you know do justice league was their initial offer um and so i had a deadline in my head i mean it's like I'd already started to make arrangements to go to Europe. So I said, you know, I can give you a year here. Um, and, and I want to do Batman, I said, you know, uh, that was my negotiation. Um, but uh, so Detective Comics was supposed to have seven issues before my time ran out. <clears throat> but the earliest ones started to really sell. So then they added an extra issue in the summer. So all of a sudden there were eight. And I had, you know, because I was only going to be there for so long, I had kind of worked out the seven issue structure. And all of a sudden there was this extra issue, which turned out to be good because it allowed me to write scenes like the one where Bruce and Silver are at a restaurant and they're both thinking things and stuff. I could do more. I could open things up more than I could have. But in any event, we needed a villain. And you know, I'd already used Joker and Penguin and, you know, it's like I could go get Mad Hatter or, or, you know, Scarecrow or somebody. But Julie Schwartz, who was the editor, for whatever reason, he said, what about Deadshot? And we said, well, Deadshot's a guy in a tuxedo with six guns on his hips. That's what? But we thought, well, you know, that, that'll be a challenge. And so Marshall pretty much, you know, redesigned him. Um, and and then he fit into the you know into the into the eight issues pretty well yeah uh and of course ever since then he's been an integral part of the dc universe i will say mr steve Engelhart, that out of everything that you've created all of the crazy stuff like ending the world and uh sending the avengers back in time and everything the thing that astounds me the most is that you came up with a plot of the laughing fish, which is what? <laughs> like, yeah. how do you even think of that? Well, that's that's the reaction I was going for. I mean, I wanted the Joker to be crazy. I wanted him to be crazy. But you know, what does that mean? Well, he can go la 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 and crazy, or he can do something that any sane person would go, what? What is that? Right. So again. I, on, on a good day, I'm not psychotic, but I can, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to write the Joker, I got to, I got to like get inside that head and see where that guy's coming from. Um, and just somehow laughing fish 
popped into my brain. I mean, it didn't, it was not the result of a long period of study or anything. I just thought, laughing fish, that's, that's just sounds weird. And therefore, you know, I can work with that. And, and, uh, yeah, if it's one of those chain reaction things too, like if he puts his face on a fish, then does he ask for the copyright and will the cap copyright office allow it? And <laughs> Well, that, yeah, uh, that again was illustrating his craziness because he's dealing with a bureaucracy and the bureaucracy can't even understand what he's talking about. And then most people can't understand what he's talking about, but certainly a bureaucrat couldn't. And, um, uh, how yeah, do you feel? And, when... But again, the beautiful artwork. I mean, when he comes rolling in the door there, that's Marshall, right? I mean, I, I obviously said he comes in, right? But Marshall uh, was doing cool Batman stuff himself, you know, so. Yeah, and the lettering by Ben Oda, uh, uh -huh. you know, integrating itself into the artwork. Yeah. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, did you, uh, what, what did you feel like when they adapted it for the Batman animated series? Well, again, since it was DC, nobody told me about it. I, you know, I mean, I started hearing about it from fans and stuff, and then I saw it. And I was, I was impressed by the fact that it was pretty much word for word. Um, they, they didn't really rewrite it. They just kind of copied it. Um, but it only took up half the episode. So then they added the Denny O'Neill story to it. Um, so I was, I was, uh, I guess, honored that they, you know, that they wanted to do it and couldn't think of anything that they could do to it. You know, they just used it as it was. So that was cool. Yeah, I don't think they could use the ending because it involved oh. Hugo Strange and Right. Yeah. So yeah. The, that's why they patched on the, the five way revenge ending on it. Yeah. Um, which worked out because there was that whole thing with a with a with a shark and the smile, mm -hmm. smiling shark. Yeah. Uh, getting to another. To another collaboration that you had with Marshall Rogers, I will say the Silver Surfer is the first comic I ever collected. Um, okay. I have to ask this because it is legend that Stan Lee never wanted anyone else to write the Silver Surfer. And of course, right. at that point, the Silver Surfer, the big thing was that he was always stuck on Earth and he was trying to get out. In one issue, you got rid of both of those notions. Well, it, it took a while to get to that one issue. I mean, Jim Shooter called me up and said, I want you to do a Silver Surfer book. And I said, what does Stan say about this? And Shooter said, Stan's not the editor anymore. I am the editor and I want this book. So I said, well, you know, if, if, if you clear it with Stan, which he did, you know, but it, so it wasn't my idea to do that. It was my idea to get him off the earth because I was really tired of these stories that ended with him flying away sad, worrying about Shia LaBeouf. Because it was cool when it started, but it kept, they kept doing it again and again and again. And as a reader, I'm like, Let's get on with it. I'm, you know, this guy's got so much potential, and the fact that it's thwarted, that's only interesting for a while. Um, so I said to Shooter, I'm going to get him off the earth. And Shooter said, No, no, got to be same as before. <clears throat> so, well, you know, hmm, let me think. So we did a, an entire first issue um, that was later reprinted in Marvel Fanfare, um, where the Sir Silver's the surfer is on earth, meets Mantis, uh, you know, whatever. And then I was plotting the second one of those when Shooter called up and said, oh, I've changed my mind. You can get him off the earth. And so that then, you know, he went back and did a new first issue. Um, and and <clears throat> not only did it, op I mean, it opened up the entire universe for him, right? All of a sudden he can go do things in other places and he can actually accomplish stuff. But of course it also meant going into the Marvel space where all those people hang out, the in-betweener and the, the elders and the, you know, Galactus and, and all that. Um, so I was, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And I was really glad that that's what I was able to do. Because um, the surf, I mean, He's supposed to surf, right? He's supposed to go places and do things. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, all that, you know, all that was fine. Um, the problem was Marshall was always a slow artist and, you know, 
doing seven or eight issues over a year is one thing. Doing a monthly book began to, you know, he couldn't had trouble keeping up with it. Um, and so he also changed his art limb. style. He Marshall also changed yeah. his art style for it, which is yeah, yeah, fascinating. Not, it's a fascinating choice to change it. You know, decades later, why, why, why was that? Did you know? Well, I mean, I said earlier, you can see George Perez progressing month by month. I mean, hopefully people do progress and, and don't just sort of find a style and stay with it. I mean, many do, but I, I appreciate those who don't. And I, Marshall was not doing it month by month, but I think, uh, you know, given a chance to get out of Gotham City and go out into space, he, you know, sort of rethought how he was going to go at that, you know. One of the things that you did in that first issue, too, was that you had the Silver Surfer defeat the champion, the elder of the universe, the champion. And it was the first time the champion had ever lost. And I was wondering if that was something that, you know, you have to get approval for or something, because you don't, you know, the, once, the, once that genie's out of the bottle, you're not putting it back in. Now he's always, his first loss will always be to the Silver Surfer, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can never use that story of, I'm the first guy to ever beat the champion ever again after that. Well, the elders didn't really, I was talking about how thing, pe things belong to different series, but the elders didn't really belong to anybody. I mean, they appeared here, there, and, and you know, the whole gemstone thing was that had been here and there. Um, so it wasn't like I was, I mean, the champion was not so well known or so, you know, visible that 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 was hard to do, shall we say. Um, and, you know, any book needs people to lose to the hero, right? And the champion seemed, I mean, he, I, I could, anyway, yeah, that worked out in my head. Anyway. After many decades of stories of people, you know, writing about how he's failing to get off the earth how hard or how easy was it to come up with that very simple idea of just simply writing with a fantastic four to get out of the earth i had to figure out how to do it somehow right yeah. i mean he'd never gotten off and, and and now i wanted him to get off so how does he do that and the only thing he's got is his board right so it just it just occurred to me that like he always used the board and he couldn't get off. So maybe if he didn't use the board, he could. Um, very neat explanation. And then uh, and then, then he's gone. You know? And as you mentioned earlier, you were there for the start of Ron Lim on this title. That's, a, that's yeah. the book that really put him on the map. So yeah. I feel like this is a recurring theme with you as well. Like, what was yeah, it like I, seeing Ron Lim start out? Same as I've said about George and about uh, Paul Galassi. I mean, it's, it's fun to work with new guys, with new styles, uh, and watch them, <clears throat> you know, develop. Um, and I was talking about people who can't draw things. I mean, you might run into somebody like that. But if you want to draw things, then hopefully I was throwing enough stuff at everybody when I worked with them, you know, that, that they, were, they were getting a little... I don't know, challenge isn't the right word, but I mean, you know, um, I never had to worry about what could Ron Lim draw, you know? I mean, it's like, and you're doing all this galactic hoorah stuff, you know? So it's like, if you do an issue and he turns out he can't draw it, then, you know, then you need to, to rethink what you're going to do. But I never had to with Ron, so. And of course, also uh, in Coyote, you also started out another young artist named Todd McFarland. Yep, yep, I gave Todd his first job, um, which, I mean, everybody gets their first job from somebody. Um, yeah. I have not hit him up for, you know, 50% of Spawn royalties, <laughs> you know? Um, but Did yeah, you think that, he would become that big ever? Like no, when you started? I, no, that early stuff. But see, I mean, I remember early Barry Smith was just, very bad Jack Kirby imitation. Yeah. And then he turned into Barry Smith. I mean, people do that when they, you know, as they, if they are interested in being a comic book artist, they develop what it is they need to develop. And so, um, yeah, I, 
that was good uh, i'm mindful of the time so i'm just going to ask one more creative question for you from you uh okay. about this which is when you're looking into all of these different characters or whether it's you know previously created or one that you've created what is your process for getting into their heads and figuring out what makes them tick reading all the previous issues i mean that's what i did i did it back when there was only maybe 10 years of previous issues not I don't know what i'd do today if there are 60 years of previous issues but i mean the stuff you know but when i got there it was only 10 years into the marvel universe and so the thor that i was writing was thor the captain america i was writing was captain america they hadn't all been rebooted and you know changed and all this kind of stuff so i just to me the simplest thing to do i because i'd read them all as as a reader but i would go back and sit down on the first night and just <clears throat> get out my collection and start reading the old stories and then i take notes you know it's like oh here's a here's a plot idea that never got developed here's oh here's a thing that happened that might be fun to play with you know and so by the time i was ready to create my own story i was very clear on you know who this guy was over time even though he might have been written by 15 different people um yeah. if you kind of assume that it's that that's one guy then you know how does how does the thread go through that and so i just i did the research is basically it the research involved reading all the comics right but, um, uh, which is fun research yeah it is yeah <laughs> how would you how would you reconcile you know contradictions for example like like let's say if you were if if you had if you had to write spider-man like right after steve ditko and john ramita like to me i read those now and i'm like those are two different characters uh-huh and what the ditko and the romita yeah like yeah they yeah. don't read like the same character to me so well i mean the ditko stuff was primarily plotted by ditko right i mean yeah. um even more than kirby in that process i mean ditko plotted it and 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 you know left it for stan to write the dialogue i mean i i wasn't there i don't know and i'm I'm a big Stan fan, so it's not like I'm saying, oh, yeah, all the artists did all the work and he just wrote on it. He made us like the characters. He made us like, you know, the world, et cetera, et cetera. He was the voice. But, yes, but Ditko, Ditko was the driving force behind Spider-Man. And so when he left, then Stan, I guess, and probably Johnny to some extent, but Johnny, I don't think ever really was much into plotting stuff. He, he was another guy, I think, who just was happy to draw it. So it, then it became Stan, who had, you know, he dialogued all those issues and obviously had been, he knew all the, the thread that had gotten him to that point. But it, but Stan is a very different guy from, from Steve. Um, so they came at it from different angles. And again, Ditko was showing, I mean, black people were like people with lines on their faces and every, all the teenagers yeah. wore ties and stuff. I mean, Ditko, wasn't really in sync with the swing in the sixties, um, and and Romita, you know, had drawn everything, but he'd also he'd drawn a lot of um, romance stuff. I mean, he could he could make Mary Jane look good because uh, you know when Mary Jane shows up with her back to you in the Ditko things, she's wearing some sort of ugly dress and her hair is weird, and you know that yeah. wasn't that wasn't Ditko's. Ditko was interested in the weirdness of the you know Peter Parker's existence. He didn't much care, I don't think, about Peter Parker's girlfriend, for example, or you know any of that stuff. Or accurate uh, representation of anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Romita could make everybody look good. Everybody, you know, Peter Parker got to look better. All the girls started to look better. I mean, immediately they did because that's what Romita could do. Um, so it was. I'm sure the idea was to like move spider-man into the swing in 60s it's still as a nerd but at least in the in the in the in the more recognizable to the readers you know um and i really again i don't know how the end came about with ditko and, and stan but um you know i mean the, the ditko stuff is cool because it's ditko stuff but it it was very different from 
what Spider-Man became. There's so much of your career left, but I know we've got an hour and 15 minutes at this point. So I'm just going to ask you if you had to look back on your whole career, what is the one thing that you, that you're surprised by the most? Like the thing that you worked on and then got big and you just didn't expect it to, to have ever gotten to that level? Well, spe the specific answer to that question is Star-Lord. Um, I created Star-Lord as this total asshole and I was going to like bring him out of all that into a more open universal consciousness over the course of the series, but I only wrote the first issue where he was an asshole. And then, then I left. So it was up to the people who followed Claremont and, and others to kind of like go, okay, what do we do with this guy? You know? So they, you know, but he never became like super popular or anything. He didn't, he didn't have a regular series. He just, they sort of did one-offs here and there. So I would say the biggest surprise was when I heard they were going to do this movie with Star-Lord in it. I was like, what? what? That's, you know, if I had to rank all the people that I created in terms of which ones were going to be in a movie, he would have been at the bottom of the list. Um, so that's the biggest surprise. You gave him basically the origin of a supervillain. Wouldn't yeah. You say? Yeah. That's what I, you know, I mean, I, I did that in a number of cases where I, would get somebody who was clearly not a superhero and then you could see them turn into being a superhero you know and that's i mean this guy was going to be more of a probably more like the silver surfer by the time he was done i mean you know i, I but i mean we don't know much about noran rad or at least we didn't when i was involved with it so we don't know what noran rad was like really before he became the silver surfer but that's what we were going to find out with star lord was kind of like this guy that nobody likes, but little by little, he figures out how to make himself a better person um, and, and eventually you know, achieves cosmic oneness, whatever. But I never did it. I mean, that's another thing. I, I don't, I said, you know, when I was doing the Batman that I had to figure out how to do it in seven issues because I knew I only had seven issues. As a general rule, I don't plan things out very far in advance. I mean, I let the story unfold as I've talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I have a structure that I can say, here's what I was gonna do with Star-Lord, but I'm sure when I actually did it, it would have been different. How did you collaborate back then with Steve Gunn? Cause you know, I knew he was here and in the Philippines. Yeah. And, yeah. Was that it was just by, by mail. I mean, we didn't have internet still yeah. you know so it was it was just um did it take a long time to get... I, I don't think so i you know it's been a long time but it's been a long time so i don't think it was a long time um i don't know how long the mail to the philippines and back again yeah how that worked exactly but i don't recall waiting you know an inordinate amount of time for for stuff to get done he was probably fast i've never met him you know um uh I, but i i don't recall having a problem of any sort uh my last question is what is did you ever have a script where you wrote something and then the artist did something that completely surprised you and what if you have multiple what is the best story about that uh, probably Luke Cage. Uh, when I was trying to work my way through Luke Cage, I would every month I would think about, okay, what can Luke Cage do, and how would that work in this storyline, and so on and so forth. And then um, <clears throat> I can say now it was George Tuska, who was old school, and he would get scripts. Maybe he didn't respect me as the new guy, or maybe he did this to everybody. I don't know, but I mean. I'd get the art back and it, would, it wouldn't be the story that I had given. I mean, you know, it's like he'd simplify things or leave things out or do whatever just for his own sake, I guess. But I didn't, I was the new guy. I didn't have any clout. I couldn't go and say, you need to discipline George Tuska because he was, you know, uh, had a lot, much longer history than I did. <clears throat> so I was sort of forced 
most months to kind of go, okay, Luke Cage would never do this. So how do I make it sound like he would? How do I explain it so that it makes sense? And, and it was a valuable lesson in writing, you know? Um, how do you explain the inexplicable? Well, you know, whatever. Um, but it wasn't much fun, you know? Um, but that, that getting stuff back that wasn't what I had asked for was, was probably the biggest surprise. All right. Thank you, Steve Englehart. You're welcome.